Welcome, and thank you for choosing to watch my presentation. My name is Ken Hackbarth, and my presentation will demonstrate the value of 3D printed assistive technology and why 3D printed key guards are the best way for you to get started with this new technology. First, a bit about me. I'm the president of Volkswitch. Volkswitch is an organization devoted to the democratization of assistive technology by leveraging the power and promise of 3D printing. Volkswitch is committed to designing customizable, 3D printable devices and putting those designs in the hands of the people who need them. Prior to my current position, I worked for almost three decades as a system architect for AT&T Bell Laboratories and its subsequent divestitures. I have a Master of Science in Systems Engineering from the University of Arizona and a Master of Education in Special Education with a concentration in assistive technology from Bowling Green State University. I have no financial relationships to disclose. I've created three questions for you in association with this presentation. They will cover these three topics. How does 3D printing as a technology differ from traditional manufacturing methods? What activities comprise the four-step process for designing and 3D printing a key guard? Identify three options for producing a 3D printed device. I've put an asterisk on the slides associated with these topics to help remind you to pay special attention when we get there. On this slide, I've tried to represent my proposal as a picture and at the same time call out the two arguments that I need to convince you of. First, I need to convince you that there's a wealth of high value, freely available, 3D printable, and easily accessible assistive technology designs that you can take advantage of right now. Even if you already believe that, you may believe there's an impenetrable technological and financial wall between you and those devices. So my second goal will be to convince you that there's a gateway through that technological and financial wall called 3D printed key guards. But first, a little context. Let's all get on the same page as to what someone means when they use the words 3D printing. The simplest definition of 3D printing that I can think of is 3D printing takes a digital model and layer by layer turns it into a physical object. A digital model is a virtual object created using specialized software called Computer Aided Design or CAD software. In this example, someone has created a virtual rabbit wearing sunglasses. That digital model is then sliced into a series of horizontal layers by another piece of software called, of all things, a slicer program. The slicer then tells a 3D printer to print each layer on top of the previous, starting at the bottom. A 3D printer uses thermoplastic filament, or photosensitive resin, to create the final physical object. The instructions can be repeated over and over to create additional copies. But how does 3D design and printing work in actual practice? This slide shows the process for creating an assistive technology device. The process exists in both the virtual world of computer software and the physical world of 3D printers and human beings. The process begins in the upper left side of this diagram with the creation of a design, a 3D model. In truth, the process begins with the identification of a need or problem and a discussion of possible solutions. You then draw up the leading contender as a 3D design using CAD software. Step two is to slice that design and hand the instructions to the 3D printer. In step three, you print the device. Step four is the critical step of testing the device. Great ideas on paper don't always translate to great ideas in the real world. If you're like the rest of us, the trial will identify the shortcomings of your design or tell you that you need to take an entirely different path. In either case, you go back to your original design and incorporate the improvements needed or create a new design altogether. The process repeats or iterates until you confirm that your device meets the needs of your customer. Alternatively, you may learn that the need cannot be met with a 3D printed device. 
With that in mind, why is 3D printing so unique? How does it differ from traditional manufacturing? 3D printers and the materials they use are relatively cheap. They are general purpose by nature and can create something on the second run that is entirely different from the item created on the first run. Traditional manufacturing methods, on the other hand, utilize expensive, special purpose machines and processes. Once those machines and processes are in place, there's no tolerance for changing the final product. Because of all the software support for design and the simplicity of implementation, you can implement a 3D printed solution very quickly. In the traditional manufacturing world, a tremendous amount of time is put into the design of the product and process before a single machine is turned on. Rapid production of a physical object and the fact that the cost of materials was very small encourages iterating until the final result is just right. Expensive machines, materials, and processes, on the other hand, force a traditional manufacturer into a result that is locked in stone. Inexpensive 3D printers and plastic filament make it possible to have a 3D printing factory local to you in your home or business and put the process close to the people who will use the end product and facilitates their involvement in shaping the design so that it works for them. Traditional manufacturers must design for an average customer and can't accommodate customization and personalization of their products. Here are a couple of fun examples of why 3D printing is the future of manufacturing. Several years ago, the astronauts on the space station needed a wrench to perform their work. NASA was able to design a wrench for them, emailed the design to the space station, and the astronauts printed it on the space station's printer. You can print that wrench for yourself by downloading the design from the NASA website. Many companies like Mila, the vacuum cleaner company, make many of their parts and accessories available as 3D printable models that can then be freely downloaded from their website. With that context, let's take a look at actual examples of freely available assistive technology designs. I'm going to quickly cycle through several examples. Each example will include a picture of the device and the cost of the plastic required to print one. The title of each slide includes a hyperlink to the 3D model.
Here's a compilation of some of the best sites to visit if you're looking for AT designs. The first two sites are repositories of 3D models in general. You'll need to search specifically for assistive devices, but they have hundreds of designs. The remaining sites focus on assistive technology. If you get into modeling AT, I would encourage you to post your designs at least at Thingiverse and Makers Making Change to share with others. Downloading and printing free AT designs is one thing, but think of the possibilities available to you when you have your own personal design and manufacturing capability. Let me tell you a story. Last year I attended a cooking class at a facility in Colorado that serves adults with physical and developmental disabilities. A young woman in the class was asked to come to the front, was given a bag of sugar, a scoop, a large mixing bowl, and a glass measuring cup. And she was asked to scoop out two cups of sugar and put it in the large bowl. She never successfully completed the task. I thought later about how difficult the task is. It's difficult to manipulate the scoop inside the bag, unless the scoop is so much smaller than the opening in the bag. As you look down on the glass measuring cup, all the writing is backwards, and there are a number of lines that have nothing to do with what you're trying to measure. If you happen to overfill the measuring cup, how do you get the right amount of sugar or flour back in the bag? It occurred to me that there's another baking ingredient that's actually very easy to measure, baking powder. That's because the baking powder container comes with a special shelf that makes measurement as simple as choose the correct size of measuring spoon, scoop up a heaping amount of the powder, and then scrape the top of the spoon against the shelf. Excess powder falls nicely back into the can, and you're left with the exact measurement you need for your recipe. Is there a way to replicate the process with sugar or flour that normally come in five pound bags? Here's what I came up with. We can easily get measuring cups that hold a specific amount of something when filled to the top. I just needed a way to store the sugar in a container that I can add a lip to. I discovered a plastic storage container for shoes online. It'll easily hold five pounds of sugar. It also has a lip at the front top edge of the box that can be used to scrape off excess sugar. The problem with the box is that the drawer can be pulled out too far and then you run the risk of sugar falling behind the drawer when it's scraped. So I needed a way to stop the drawer when it was in just the right position for the scraping step. I took the box apart and saw that it had channels in the bottom where I could mount a pair of stops. I broke out a ruler in my CAD software and soon came up with a design for a pair of stops that would fit nicely and securely in those channels. I reassembled the box and now it works perfectly. Measuring out the correct amount of sugar or flour is now as simple as choosing the proper measuring cup, scooping, and counting the right number of scoops. The point of the story is that when you have your own design and manufacturing capability, you're free to focus on changing the task itself rather than training and training on an already confusing task. How much does this solution cost? $10 for the shoebox and 50 cents for the stops. Well, I hope I've at least piqued your interest in what's possible with a 3D printer. Well, what's the quickest and easiest way to get there? I believe the answer is 3D printed key guards. I'm sure that many of you are already familiar with key guards. For those people who aren't, a keyguard is a plastic plate that sits on top of a keyboard, or now, much more often, a tablet. The plastic limits access to the tablet to only those places where openings have been cut in the plate. Keyguards help people with fine motor control more effectively interact with the app on their tablet. They also allow people who are easily fatigued to rest their hand on the tablet without triggering some action within the app. They can make a huge difference in users' productivity. But how many key guards do you really need? 
Well, that will depend on the number of tablets and apps you will use or recommend, how many ways the apps can be configured, and how many tablet cases you may use, both now and in the future. If you only recommend two different tablets, each with two different cases, running two different apps, and four different configurations for those apps, you will need 2 times 2 times 2 times 4, or 32 evaluation key guards. If a quarter of those break or are lost over time, you'll need an additional 8 key guards for a total of 40. Users will need new key guards as their skills improve or degrade over time. And there are bound to be new tablets, cases, and apps in the future. I can hear what you're thinking, even though I recorded this two months ago. You're thinking there's no way you could possibly afford 40 key guards. So that's simply crazy. But would it be crazy if you could cut the cost of a key guard by 99%? I designed and printed evaluation key guards for an SLP at Imagine Colorado. They support two different tablets, one of which could be in two different cases, just one AAC app, Go Talk Now, and four possible layouts. As a result, she needed a total of 10 key guards just to perform evaluations. Well, how much does a commercial key guard cost? Here's a page from the KeyGuard AT website. KeyGuard AT is the largest producer of laser cut key guards in the United States and possibly globally. I purchased a key guard from them for touch chat running on an iPad 2, and the final cost was $71. Logan Tech sells keyguards for their systems, and this one costs $149. On the other hand, what if I designed and 3D printed that touch chat keyguard myself? First, how hard is it to design a keyguard? Fortunately, the people at Volkswitch.org have created a keyguard designer for you. Let's take a look at how easy it is to design a 3D printable keyguard. I've downloaded the free OpenSCAD and free KeyGuard.SCAD programs from the web. Complete instructions can be found on the Volkswitch website. When I launch the two, I see a screen like this. On the left is a depiction of the KeyGuard as currently specified. On the right are a set of expandable sections with options for customizing the design. I'm going to design a KeyGuard similar to the one that I purchased from KeyGuard AT. First, I'm going to specify the tablet, in this instance, an iPad 2. I can choose to expose or hide the camera and home button, but I'm going to leave them exposed. I can also swap the location of the two, and that might be necessary depending on the tablet's case. A detailed explanation of all the options and their implications for the design can be found at the Volkswitch website. Next, I'll specify the layout of the TouchChat app. I'll specify the heights of various components of the app. I can take the measurements using a metric ruler or by counting pixels in a screenshot. According to my measurements, the status bar and the upper message bar are a combined 11 millimeters in height. Note that the picture on the left updates with each change so I can immediately see if I've made a mistake. The upper command bar is 9 millimeters in height. I'll expose the message bar but not the command bar. There is no lower message bar or command bar in the touch chat app so I'll leave these unchanged. I can provide easier manual and visual access to the message bar by changing the bar slope from 90 degrees to 45. This is only possible because we will be 3D printing the key guard. This is not possible for a laser cut acrylic key guard where every cut is at 90 degrees. Now we'll lay out the grid area. The app will have five columns 
and five rows. I could widen the rails between the buttons and change the slope of the rails. Again, laser cut key guards can only have 90 degree cuts. I can change the shape of the openings from rectangular to circular or from circular to rounded rectangles. And I control how rounded those corners will be. But let's go back to a simple rectangular openings since that's what I ordered. I have the option to cover certain cells in the grid or merge them both horizontally and vertically. I can make fine adjustments to the location of the rails by adding padding, but that's not necessary with the Touch Chat app. We're almost done. The last thing we need to do is settle on the mounting method for the key guard. If I'm not using a case, I have the option to use suction cups, in which case cuts are made to accommodate the top of each suction cup. I can go with Velcro, in which case recesses are added to the underside of the key guard. I can go with screw on straps that I purchased from Keyguard AT in which case cuts are made to accommodate those straps. I can go with clip-on straps and 3D print the clips. Finally, I can use micro-suction tape in which case I don't need any special mounting features. But it's rare that a tablet doesn't go into a case. The keyguard key I purchased from Keyguard AT was going into an AVAWO kids case. So let's go to the tablet case section and tell the program that we have a case. We now have to tell the program the size of the opening in the case since that's what determines the overall size of the key guard. The opening of my case is 163 millimeters high and 215 millimeters wide. It also has rounded corners with a five millimeter radius. Now we'll look at the options for mounting this key guard in a case. I can still go with clip-on straps and print my own clips. I can choose the traditional slide-in tabs. And finally, I can go with raised tabs. This may be my best choice for a hard-sided case with a screen protector, but my case is soft-sided so I'm just going to wedge the keyguard into place, so I'll choose no mount. My design is ready to go, so I'll tell OpenSCAD to render my design. Lastly, I'll tell it to export my design as an STL file. The next step is to print it. And how difficult is it to print a key guard? This video is going to show you how you take an STL file and turn it into a printed key guard. So we produced a, an STL file from OpenSCAD. And now we're just going to take it, drag it, and drop it into our 
slicer. In this case, I'm using the Prusa edition of slicer. You may be using an entirely different slicer program for your printer. The first step in this program is to slice the model and then you're just going to export the G code. This is the language that the printer understands. And I'm going to put it on an SD card. That didn't take very long, so it's now on the SD card and we can load the SD card into the printer. The SD card is loaded. The printer is about to begin printing the key guard. It'll take about four hours to print the entire key guard. Printer is going through a level eight leveling process, and then it will begin printing. We won't see the entire print because four hours is a long time, but we will come back eventually at the end to take a look at the finished key guard. It's time to remove the key guard from the build surface. So we'll take it, crack it, take it off. So there we have it finished key guard. All right, time to see how our new key guard actually fits. What we're going to do is we're just going to wedge it right into the case. There it is. Nice fit all the way around. And it's just not going to come out, but you can pull it out quite easily and swap in a new key guard. All of that for about a dollar. Well, how much did it cost to print that key guard? That depends on how much plastic filament was used. This is a screen capture from the Slicer software. If you tell the software how much you pay for a kilogram of filament, the software will tell you how many grams of filament your print will require and calculate the cost of filament for you. In this example, the key guard cost me 97 cents. And how much electricity did I use? Well, I printed several key guards in different sizes and looked at the amount of electricity that was used in each case. The more filament required by the key guard, the longer the print will take and the more electricity will be used. The bottom line is a typical key guard will cost something in the vicinity of 40 grams of filament, which translates to about six cents of electricity. I think that means you can basically ignore the electrical costs. Let's take a look at the kinds of key guards that are possible to create with the Volkswitch designer. Here are a collection of key guards, all of which were designed with the Volkswitch key guard designer. They're roughly organized into grid based key guards, hybrid key guards, and freeform key guards. The hybrid key guards are a hybrid of grid based with some freeform elements. We'll take a closer look at these key guards next. Here are our first set of grid-based key guards. They're all designed to fit directly on the surface of a tablet without a case. You'll notice that they could be in portrait or landscape mode. This key guard is held in place by micro suction tape, which holds very well to the glass of the tablet without leaving any residue behind. Applied and removed multiple times. This key guard is using clip-on straps. Remember you can print your own clips. 
This key guard uses Velcro and this one uses suction cups. More key guards, some that use multiple colors of filament for interest, for personalization. You can see both the slide-in tabs as well as raised tabs. Here is the uh, Here's just another example that shows you how many uh, holes can be in the grid without any problem in printing. These are both clip-on straps and under certain circumstances, like with soft-sided cases, you don't even need the straps in the back for them to hold tight. You can even use these, these clip-ons with uh, key guards that have uh, screen protectors and leave very little space between the edge of the screen protector and the edge of the active area of the screen. A freeform key guard simply takes a piece of plastic and punches holes in it of a variety of shapes wherever they are needed. So this is just a key guard supporting a standard mail app, email app on an iPad. And this key guard supports the ACORN AAC app, which uses a very different algorithm for producing phrases. And it has a very specific layout for that purpose. Uh, again, in this case, the uh, program is told where every hole should be, what its size should be, what its shape should be, and you're able to produce an arbitrary key guard using that logic. These are all hybrid key guards, meaning that they're based fundamentally on a grid of openings, but they also allow for openings to be made outside of the grid in very specific locations. So this is a key guard made for, for GoTalk Now, so is this one. These two show cutouts made in the message bar for a couple of of uh, menu items in in the uh, touch chat app. This one shows you that you can add raised uh, raised features as well. Uh, buttons like that or walls around a cell or uh, little walls that lead to another location and it also demonstrates the merging of cells and the covering up of certain cells. Another nice feature is you can add text engraving to a key guard on top and I don't know how well this shows up, but here's a serial number on the underside of the key guard. And lastly, you can do some clever things with color again using multiple colors of filament. And this also demonstrates a feature of printing key guards on smaller than the largest build surface. So I can add a dovetail joint at some point in the key guard and use that joint to bring two pieces together that were printed separately. Depending on the tightness of the joint, you may not even need to uh, use some kind of, of adhesive. This is also a hybrid key guard, but I bring it uh, to your attention just to show you that you can print very large key guards on smaller size printers, but they have to be printed in two parts and then joined together. Uh, you may recognize this as an Accent 1400 key guard uh, with special case editions added so that you fill in all of the open space on the in the case. Uh, then you take these two you overlap the, the uh, dovetails, a little light tapping, and you've got a key guard that really actually isn't going to come apart, but you would have otherwise had difficulty printing this on a uh, printer even as large as 300 millimeters. Finally, and though these aren't uh, made by the key guard designer, Volkswitch also offers 
a designer for creating Chromebook key guards. You just provide some very uh, simple information about the locations of the openings and the program takes it the rest of the way. Have I managed to create some excitement for you around the idea of getting a 3D printer? Then let's take a look at some options. A high quality 3D printer may be much more affordable than you think. I've owned several 3D printers over the last three years and here are my current two favorites. The first is the Artillery Sidewinder X1 which sells for around $450. The second is the Prusa i3 MK3S, which you can get in kit form for $750 and fully assembled for about $1,000. By the way, I highly recommend assembling your printer from a kit when you can. What you learn in the process will make you much more confident addressing issues in the future that you will inevitably encounter. The Sidewinder has a 300 millimeter by 300 millimeter build surface, while the Prusa has a 250 millimeter by 210 millimeter build surface. If you plan to be creating key guards with your printer, I recommend that you purchase a printer with a build surface that is at least 250 millimeters on one dimension. Both of these printers are more than capable of printing key guards. The Prusa is the highest rated consumer grade printer, and it's my go to printer for my day to day work. Can you justify purchasing a 3D printer? Well, if you save on average $90 with every key guard that you print rather than purchase, you can justify the cost of a 3D printer if you need as little as 5 to 10 key guards. Once you have a 3D printer, you can begin to explore the full range of free, pre-designed assistive technology along with designing and printing your own solutions, which could lead to even more cost savings. How difficult would it be to use this information to put together a business case? What if the barrier is still too great, or maybe you're not ready to make that kind of commitment? How can you get access to 3D printed assistive technology without a 3D printer? If you're employed in a school district or even just a member of a school district, many districts offer STEM and STEAM programs. Those middle school and high school classes often have 3D printers that are sitting mostly idle. You can give those teachers and students a reason to dust off those printers and CAD software to produce devices that will change people's lives. There are several online companies who will print your design. Thingiverse provides easy submission of designs to three different services. I sent my TouchChat keyguard design to all three to find out what they would charge. The prices vary somewhat, but on average represent a two-thirds savings over purchasing that same keyguard from Keyguard AT. You may have a local library with a 3D printing service. The Loveland Public Library is a few miles from me and they charge you just 10 cents per gram to print a design that you email to them. Remember that my slicer program told me the TouchChat keyguard requires 40 grams of filament? That's a total of $4 for a keyguard, and I didn't have to purchase or maintain the printer, nor did I have to purchase and store the filament. This eye chart is a listing of Facebook groups that focus on 3D printing in general, the Prusa line of printers, and the Artillery line of printers. A majority of the people in these groups are excited about 3D printing as a technology and their own 3D printer, but they've tired of printing Yoda heads and baby Groots. Their shelves are full of decorative items and they're wondering if that's all there is to this technology. If you post to a few of these groups and describe your need, I guarantee you will hear from someone who is dying to finally use their printer to create something of real value. You may need to reimburse them for the filament and postage, but then again, you may not. Are you a member of a parents group? Could the members of the group pool their resources and purchase a printer and some filament? I suspect that every parents group harbors a father who'd love to do the research, purchase and house the printer and become an expert in its use. I wouldn't be honest if I didn't admit that I have some concerns about 3D printing, especially 3D printed assistive technology. I think this is the most subtle dark side of 3D printed AT. It's easy to become overly enamored with the technology and start to see every problem as having a 3D printed solution. 
As you think through possible responses to a need or solutions to a problem, be very clear about all the demands on that solution, especially those related to safety. Because consumer grade 3D printers print with thermoplastics, the devices they produce will always have limited strength and a limited range of environmental temperatures. They may also degrade if exposed to long periods of sunlight. Those wonderful, freely downloadable designs you find on the web have probably not been tested with respect to their safety, or in some cases even their effectiveness. If a device should fail and someone should get hurt, it's really unclear who's liable, if anyone. And because this is a presentation largely about key guards, you cannot create the equivalent of a laser cut acrylic key guard in the sense that you cannot produce a transparent 3D printed device. You may be concerned about the safety of 3D printing. In my opinion, it's a relatively safe technology. Some vendors make a big deal about 3D printing safety and charge schools thousands of dollars for a school safe 3D printer. They do this by putting their printers in cabinets with special fans and filters. These companies typically sell 3D printing systems that lock you into an overpriced filament as well. Strangely, their printers often represent 3D printing technology that's several years old. In reality, you can take some simple steps to ensure that everyone remains safe around a 3D printer. Let's look at the most common safety concerns and how you can deal with them. Every fused deposition modeling or FDM printer has a heater block that melts plastic at temperatures in excess of 200 degrees Celsius. That's twice as hot as boiling water. You may be tempted on occasion to use your fingers to wipe away the little bit of plastic that oozes out of the nozzle at the start of a print. Please don't. An adult should always supervise young children when they're watching an operating printer. Watching a printer slowly turn an idea into a 3D object can be mesmerizing. Just keep your hands in your pockets. A heated build plate can help a print adhere better to prevent print failures and resist warping. The temperature of the plate can run from room temperature to 70 degrees Celsius, depending on the filament type. You probably won't get burned by touching the build plate, but it can be uncomfortable. Don't touch the build plate until the print has finished and the build plate has come back to room temperature. The print will come loose from the build plate easier when it is cooled down. Plastic filaments come in a variety of formulations. Some are smellier than others. ABS is particularly stinky when printing. It's also hard to print with because it has a tendency to warp. ABS was very popular in the early days of 3D printing, but not anymore. Now there are much better filaments that have very little smell and are easy to print with. Plastic filaments can release particulates and organic compounds when melted. Again, ABS is a significant offender here. You shouldn't experience much of a problem if you stick with filaments like PLA, PETG, and TPU. In fact, for the kind of devices that I've shown you today, these are probably the only filaments you will ever need. You may find that you never need anything other than PLA. The print head and build surface move around a lot in the process of creating a 3D object, often quickly. You don't want to get your hands in the path of either moving part. It's not good for you, and it's probably much worse for the printer. Just keep your hands in your pockets. You may choose to avoid all these issues by locating the printer in a separate room with reasonable ventilation. It's relatively easy to set up a webcam and watch the print progress from the comfort of your computer. Many Chinese 3D printers come with a paint scraper. Because some filaments stick way too well to the build surface, you'll have to pry the printed object off using a scraper like this. The scrapers are usually very sharp so they can get under the edge of the print. If you're ever going to hurt yourself using a 3D printer, it will probably be while you're prying a print loose from the build surface with one of these scrapers. If you let the build surface cool down completely, most prints will release all by themselves. 
This is what happens to objects printed on the special build plate material of the artillery sidewinder. The Prusa has a special flexible build plate that forces the print to pop off when you flex it. I was shocked when I came across this journal article that says, PT professors believed that 3D printed crutch tips could replace missing crutch tips on their pre-existing crutches. A commercial crutch tip costs $6.60. A 3D printed crutch tip costs about $1.47. If the 3D printed crutch tip fails, how much will that cost? The bottom line is never use a 3D printed device in a situation where failure of the device could result in injury to the user. How can you recognize an AT device that's a good candidate for 3D modeling and printing? Look for these characteristics. One of the most important characteristics is that it calls out to be customized. If one size will fit all, then traditional manufacturing techniques can produce thousands of them for pennies. Because the needs of disabled individuals often vary so greatly, assistive technology often requires customization. You should ensure that your design has customization built in. Try to avoid designs that will only meet a single individual's needs. Try to think broader than that. Commercial manufacturers of assistive technology have devoted their lives to serving a traditionally underserved community, often on very thin margins. If your design doesn't represent a breakthrough in customization and personalization, or doesn't offer a significant cost savings for families, then you should abandon your plans and go with the commercial device. 3D printed plastic devices are stronger than you might think, but you shouldn't ask too much of them. You shouldn't expose them to pressures greater than 50 pounds. Also, they may be printed at temperatures double the boiling point of water, but they will begin to deform at temperatures much less than that. You should focus on devices that can be used at room temperature. Avoid using or storing them in places like the dashboard of your car in summer. A 3D print is composed of a series of very thin layers. Even if you use a transparent filament, the final print will be at best translucent. Those layers will be visible on all vertical surfaces and can be abrasive when placed against sensitive skin. You can smooth these surfaces by wet sanding them, but that will add additional time and effort to the process. The 3D modeling and printing process facilitates iteration. So the fact that a device will require iteration before it's a good fit is a sign that you're on the right track in choosing this technology. 3D modeling tools work with geometric primitives like circles, squares, cylinders, and cubes. If you can visualize your device as a combination of these primitives, then your modeling work will be a lot easier and you'll be able to build in a great deal of customization. You can model organic shapes by taking 3D scans of an object, but that's usually a sign that your model will only meet the needs of a single individual. I started out by telling you that 3D printed key guards are your gateway to 3D printed assistive technology. So let's see how well they stack up against these characteristics. Volkswitch has created a single key guard designer that should allow you to create almost any key guard for tablets. Since there are tens of tablets, tens of cases, tens of apps, each which can be configured in tens of ways, sufficient customization had to be built into the designer to support tens of thousands of possible key guards. A 3D printed key guard can cost from one third to one hundredth as much as a commercial key guard. As such, it can make it possible for an SLP to have on hand all the key guard variants that they need when evaluating the abilities of an individual. They can be produced in a rainbow of colors and support mounting methods that are simply impossible when starting with a simple sheet of acrylic. Key guards rest on the surface of a tablet. That means they have no special strength requirements. If you step on one and break it, you will likely have broken the tablet as well, and you'll have bigger problems than a broken key guard. In any event, replacing the key guard will only set you back a few dollars. 
They are typically used in home and school environments, so they're rarely exposed to extreme temperatures. While we often think of key guards as transparent, because we're used to seeing key guards cut from sheets of acrylic, transparent key guards can create visual problems for their users as light from the tablet refracts through internal faces of the key guard. So an opaque 3D printed key guard will often be preferred over a transparent one. Additionally, a user may place their hand on a 3D printed key guard, but not for an extended period. When you're designing the first instance of a key guard, especially if you're working with someone in another location, you'll probably need to give them multiple drafts of their key guard that they'll use to test for effectiveness before settling on a final specification. Finally, a key guard is literally a rectangular block of plastic with holes cut in it. Note that with 3D printing, you don't actually cut holes. Instead, you lay down plastic everywhere but where the holes should be. Time for some final thoughts. If you're planning to create some 3D printed key guards, two of the most important measurements are the height and width of the opening in the case. Unfortunately, it's very hard to take these measurements accurately with a ruler. So we've created a 3D printable tool, our easy measurement tool, specifically designed for this purpose. How much does it cost? Well, if you email me and request an easy measurement tool, I'll send you one for free. At this point in the presentation, I'd normally open up the discussion to questions from the audience. Since that won't be possible, I want to encourage you to send me your questions. I really want you to be successful, so please don't hesitate to contact me. Finally, don't forget to apply for the CEUs that you've earned. You can also get a copy of the slides from this presentation from the CTG website. I've embedded my comments for each slide in the PowerPoint slide notes. Come here. Give kiss. <gasps> Thank you. I want video. Oh,